There we go, right on cue. Thank you, Julie. This will be up at this link here later with the uh, PowerPoint. And so if you wanna go back and look at it later, it will be available. Uh, we are going to do chat box check-ins as we go through, but please, we're, we're a small group. So feel free to stop us at any time if you have questions or if you have something that you want clarified. If you find that I'm moving too quickly through the presentation, please feel free to stop me, ask me to slow down, repeat something, whatever you need, this is your training. So feel free to ask for, for me to accommodate in a way that makes sense for you. This is the team. Somebody put teams in chat and this is our team. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the federal programs coordinator. I am the one who gets to work with this amazing group. Uh, before I joined the department just over five years ago, I worked as a special education teacher for 30 years. I worked primarily with students with autism and loved every minute of it. But like I said, I joined the department about five years ago, and I am very happy to be here. Uh, Jennifer, could you please come on quickly and say hello? Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. <laughs> I joined the department about two years ago. Prior to that, I too was a special education teacher and an ed tech as well. Thank you, Jennifer. And Carly? Hi, I am Carly Thibodeau, and I joined the team about a year ago, last July. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Thanks, Carly. Ashley is our newest team member, and we haven't scared her off yet. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes, I am the newest member of the team. It's been two months, so <laughs> I'm happy to be here with you guys. <laughs> and Ashley, can you share with, with everybody what you were doing before you joined us? Yes, I was a special ed teacher in ed tech, um, a teacher for 14 years, uh, both here and in Virginia. Thank you so much. So we were all teachers before we joined the department. We, we, we know what you're doing. Thank you. And Julie, who we call our Wrangler. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I am in my sixth year with the Maine DOE. And prior to that, I was at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Thank you. I think we had a couple more people just jump in. So if you did, please add your name, your school and or district and your role, please. We just really like to see who joins us. This is our contact information. I'm gonna share it again. But if you have any questions or comments after the fact, if you wanna reach out with, um, you know, if you just need us for anything, please feel free to reach out. We really work hard to maintain contact with the field. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. So this is the first in our series of office hours. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about resources. We offer a variety of resources and today we're just going to sort of touch on where you can find them, what they are, and how we hope that you're going to use them. And this sort of came about because we, the department, is being audited by the big DOE, by the federal department. And in the process of that, I found myself completely overwhelmed by the amount of resources that were being shared with me. And all of these resources were being shared with me in an attempt to be helpful, but I just was so overwhelmed with, well, here's another resource that might be useful. Here's another one. Here's another one. And it was just like, oh my gosh, they're sharing all of these things. They're supposed to be helpful, but I don't know where any of them are located. I don't know if I've already gotten this one. I don't, you know, they were talking about this one and that one and this one and that one. And it was just like, it just became too much for me. So I thought, you know what, we're kind of doing the same thing to the field. We talk about this and we talk about that, but but have we ever really sort of put them all in one place and talked about them as a group? So that's what today is sort of about. So I'm hoping this is helpful. So we're gonna just walk through some of those for you. So our website has been updated. It is so much more user-friendly. It is, it's much more clear. It's really not been nicely delineated. And if you go to this link here at the bottom of this slide, it will take you directly to this, this page right here, the resources page, okay? And that's what this looks like. These are obviously not live links, okay? But if you go to this link, this live link at the bottom, it will take you to this and you can see what you will find on this page. You will find our office hours, the schedule with the registration links, which I'm gonna show you as we walk through. 
as we are now this monitoring team, we are now a um, results based and accountability. We are following a rubric to determine when SAUs are up for monitoring. We are no longer following the four year schedule. The rubric is up if you go to that link. The special education director directory is on our website now. The monitoring cohort projection list is on there. So you'll be able to see when your SAU is up for monitoring as well as the procedural manual. So those are some of the resources. We're not gonna talk about all of them because most of those are very self-explanatory, but we're gonna get into some of them. This is also on there. So you can see how this is divided. So on the left-hand side, it's divided into the SAU and the CWS. CWS is Communities Without Schools. So you can see all the resources there. The, this is primarily for the monitoring process. These are the forms and the information that if your SAU is in monitoring, this is the information that we look at, that we will engage with. So the letter of notification and instruction, if you're in if you're in cohort, that's the letter that your special education director will receive, or if you're in the SAU or the CWS. There is a self-assessment form, again, if you're in cohort that you have to fill out, you'll find that. The IEP quick reference document, we are going to dig into that as part of this presentation, so I won't spend too much time here. Extended school year versus year-long programming, that would be if you have a student who is in an SPPS program that follows a regular school year versus an SPPS that goes year round. There's some clarification around that at that document. We're not gonna talk about that today and transition assessments and resources. We're not gonna talk about that today either because we do have a presentation that is specific to transition planning. CDS resources are there and regional program resources are there. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on either one of those because both of those also have their own presentations. So we are going to talk a lot about the procedural manual. This is a document that is absolutely phenomenal. And we talk about this at every one of our trainings. And I realized last night when I was finishing this up that you know we talk about it, but I have never once shared or given any credit to the individuals who developed this procedural manual. This was last updated August 1st, 2020 by the IEP committee. So I just wanted to put a little snip here for to recognize the individuals who wrote this committee, who, who wrote this manual, and you can see who those individuals are. Um, there is currently an updated IEP committee and we are working to update the procedural manual. So once that happens, we will speak more to that. Um, but these, these people really deserve the credit for the procedural manual. And as you can see, the link is there. We're gonna talk about that. Here's the manual. And here are the table of contents. And this manual, if you do not have it, you want to go to the link and grab it because it goes into a lot of detail about every single one of these activities. And we're going to talk very specifically about, for example, determination of adverse effect. Okay. So if you have an adverse effect form that you need to fill out, okay, you would go right to page six as indicated in the table of contents, and it walks you through exactly how to fill out this form. So if you're not really sure, or if you can't quite remember, then you wanna pull out the procedural manual and allow it to walk you right through it. So you can see determination of adverse effect at the top there, and then it tells you what the form is used to do, right? Provide a written record regarding the determination of adverse effect on educational performance. And then it gives you a little clip of the form, and then it defines what adverse effect is, and then it tells you very specifically the directions. So the use of the form is limited to determination of eligibility for special ed services, consideration of a change in eligibility for special ed services, or dismissal from special ed services. So you know that if you're considering any one of those three pieces, you would want to use this form, okay? And you would use this form only for the following eligibility categories, and it lists them out for you. So it really breaks down how you would consider that first box on the adverse effect form. 
And then section 1A, assessment data and sources. Again, that's one small clip off of the form itself. And again, it tells you this section is used to document data considered and indicate whether it supports a determination of adverse effect. And again, it gives you the examples, the directions. So you'd wanna read through those directions very specifically and then think about, am I following those directions? Do I have the information that those directions are asking me to consider, okay? And then number two, looking at those scores. Do I have examples of those data sources? Am I incorporating the pieces I need to incorporate to make sure I'm filling this form out correctly? Number three, same thing. It's got the same sort of breakdown, really looking at three, four, five, and six for each one of those samples to tell you, what are some data sources I can consider for each one of these pieces? So if you're not really sure, again, pull out your procedural manual. What are child work products? What are some examples of that? Well, you could look at writing prompts, handwriting samples, portfolios, classroom work samples. Those could be some examples that you could consider as evidence here on page eight of the procedural manual. Section 1B breaks it all down for you. This section is used to indicate whether only one assessment or data source was considered. And if, and if so, explain why that was adequate, adequate. And then determination of adverse effect. So it breaks it all down, tells you what the section is for, and then the direction. So I don't need to read all of that for you, but I just pulled this out so that you can see how the procedural manual will help you help clarify for you exactly how you need to fill out the adverse effect form so that if there are any questions, this is the place where you can go. So if we look, I'm gonna go backwards. If you're car sick, I apologize, close your eyes. These table of contents outlines for you just a variety of areas. It really is a very um, concise manual that will answer so many of those questions that you might have. I just chose adverse effect to use as an example. Okay, MUSER is another document that we reference quite a bit. It's the main unified special education regulations. It's another important resource. However, I gotta be honest with you. Here's the summary, there's the link to it. It is a massive document, massive. This is just the table of contents. There are five pages that just cover the table of contents. And I did not even, you know, I looked at trying to make some clips of different components, but there are two reasons why I chose not to do that. One, it's a massive document. It is huge. And two, Muser is being rewritten right now. Um, we have a team uh, in the department that is working to rewrite it and to really um, clean it up, make it much more user friendly. There is no, I have no time frame for which that will be released. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, specifics around how that needs to be done. Aaron Fraser is working very very hard with all of us to help that happen. Um, so our best guidance is if you have questions around Muser, reach out to one of us and we can do our best to sort of walk you through it. But Muser is a very important resource for us to share with you, regardless because it is the law. These are the, these are, this is, this is our state regulations. This is what we are held to. So you will hear us reference Muser and we do share the link to Muser in most of our professional development. So we wanted to make sure that you had access to it. So I just shared two pretty important resources. Are there any questions about either one of those so far before I move on? Are any Anybody need me to stop or go back or anything? Anything in chat? Nothing in chat. Nothing in chat. Perfect. Thank you. All right. This next document is probably my favorite. Okay. This is the IEP quick reference document. So, oh my goodness, I'm looking at my slides. I think they're out of order. So bear with me. The IEP quick reference document is a document that we developed uh, about a year and a half ago. And what this does is it aligns to 
the Word document, which has replaced what we called the electronic monitoring tool or the EMT. And that is what is in place for our current 23-24 cohort. This document will be amended annually as our Word document gets amended with every cohort. And we will be sharing this annually because we want the field to know exactly what we are auditing every year. So even if your SAU or your CDS site is not in cohort, we still want you to know what we're looking at because I think it is best practice for you to always be sort of on top of if there are changes in the field or if there are changes in the regulations as brought down to us from federal DOE, right? Because we don't make those changes ourselves. They come down from above us. We just like everybody to know that this is what this is what we're always looking at. So here's where the that's that's where the funky order is. So I apologize for that. But that's the link to the document. And the document will take you right to the IEP itself again on our website. So it will help you in developing and, and writing a compliant IEP. If you follow the tips and tricks on this document, I guarantee you, you will have a nearly perfect IEP, I promise. Um, and it also will link you back to the procedural manual. So when I was trying to put this together, when we were trying to put this together as a team, what, what we wanted to do was to take our professional development, our IEP PowerPoint, which is a massive PowerPoint, and the procedural manual and just put everything sort of in one place. Again, resources, right? You don't want to be overwhelmed with resources. How could we put as much information into one place as possible so that you didn't have to, all right, where's my procedural manual? Where's my this? Where's my that? So that you could just sort of pull one thing and have as much in one place as possible. That's how I like to operate. And I think this might help. Okay. So here it is. What this has, it has the finding. This first column, the left-hand column has the finding. The finding is not necessary, it's, it's not anything you have to worry about, the codes you don't have to worry about, but the codes are what will show up on your corrective activity plan, your, your corrective action plan, okay? The codes just represent the finding, okay? So for example, RAE1, represents results of evaluation that they it just for us in terms of being able to identify and talk about the findings it just makes it easier for us but you do not have to um, memorize the codes or anything like that the next the next um, column is the location where on the IEP are we looking to find this information so the results of the evaluation obviously we are looking in section 4a we're looking in section 4A for the results of the evaluation, okay? The MUSER citation, remember we talked briefly about MUSER and the, the regulation? That's what, this, that's what this is talking about. We are looking for the results of the initial or the most recent evaluations of the child. And then below that, that first reference, that 34 CFR, that is actually a reference to IDEA. And then below that is the MUSER reference, the state rep, the, the, the state regs, okay? And then the last one is the criteria. The criteria is really the most important part in, in terms of what you need to think about and what you need to um, reference when you're writing your document, when you're writing your IEP, because that's what is going to make your IEP compliant, okay? So in terms of compliance, when you're, documenting evaluations on your IEP, what we would look for, we would look to make sure that you include evaluations that support the eligibility discussion. So if you have a student who is identified as specific learning disability, has a specific learning disability, where's the evals that support that, okay? Is the evaluation name there? Does the evaluation have a date? Those are what we look for. If you have a special ed director that says, hey, I want the evaluator, their name included, then include that. Listen to your director. But for our purposes, that's what we look for. Okay. So you can see that that's how that's how this looks all the way down. That's how this this document reads all the way down. We added a couple of new items this year. And remember when I first started talking about this document, I said that it gets amended every year. Um 
And that is because as we get new information, we have to add things to, to evaluate. Or when um, we notice that the field is really struggling with a particular item, then we might have to add it. Or converse of that, if we find that the field is doing really great with something, we might pull it out, right? So we added SAS1. This is a new finding. Well, it's an old finding that we've put back in, actually. And so you can see, again, the left-hand side, that's the code. We are looking in section six for that finding. And that is a statement of supplementary aids, services, modifications, and our supports. You can see the IDEA reference followed by the user reference. And what we are looking for in terms of compliance, what makes it right, what makes it correct, what makes it compliant would be teaching supports and tools included for the student to be successful in the general education, special education. You must fill all boxes across the row. We can, there can be no blanks across the row. If a supplementary aid service modification and or support is listed, you would need to check when, where it can be used, fill the location, frequency and duration. Remember that ed techs, BHPs, related service assistance, collaborations between staff are listed here, not the service grid. So we added that because we were finding that there was some confusion. So that's a new one. That's why that one's highlighted. And we also added SVC1 this year. And that's between section seven to six, section five. That's alignment between the service grid and the goals. Again, IDEA reference, the user citation, and that is looking to make sure that every service in section seven is aligned back to a goal. So for example, if we see a consultation um, service, maybe it's PT consultation in section seven, we will flip back through the IEP to make sure that there is a consultation goal for PT. So it's just about that alignment piece, okay? So we added that this year. We also added, there we go, SVC2. We broke those out. So that is taking a look just again at the special ed and related services. We just, we separated SVC1 and SVC2 out. So those, that's just a little bit different. So um, the it's kind of funny that the IEP, that this is called a quick reference document, given the fact that it's actually 14 pages long. But it's, you know, we just wanted to be able to, like I said, we wanted to be able to have as much information that we thought would be helpful on one, just in one spot. Okay, so we hope that this is useful. Okay. Did anybody have any questions about that? Does that all make sense to everybody or um, that work for everybody? The IEP quick reference document also includes a couple of other things and we haven't quite decided if we're gonna keep those all attached or if we're gonna separate them out yet, but um, we created some one pagers that are specific to the eligible to the eligibility forms, and this is one of them. And again, they're just reminders. So if you're filling out the summary of performance form, just make sure that there are no blank boxes and make sure that section one, which is the academic section, includes data. Okay. So if you're doing that summary of performance, just have just, just remember those two points. If you are filling out a specific learning disability eligibility form, no blank boxes, make sure that your verifications include data, include strengths and weaknesses. That eligibility form needs to have signatures, don't forget that. And then when you fill out that form, you need to document the conversation in that written notice, that's very important. And it doesn't have to be a big, uh, you know, a big, paragraph. It can be something as simple as the team completed the SLD form and agreed. You know, just just it can be a simple sentence, but there has to be um, documentation that the form was completed at the meeting. Okay. Same with the, S the speech and language eligibility form. Just document the adverse impact. Verification must include data complete and, and include all severity rating scales. Even if the student does not have, for example, articulation errors, 
you would try, you would document that, but you still have to include that severity rating scale. And please document that conversation in the written notice. Adverse effect form, um, we use that as an example when we were talking about the procedural manual. If you have any questions about any of these, all that info is in the procedural manual, but for the AE form, no blank boxes. Make sure up at the top left hand, you document the reason for the use of the form. Remember for this one, NA means not available. It doesn't mean not applicable, which is how we typically think about NA. Verification must include data and remember document it in the written notice, please. B11 is child find, okay? And B11 is what we call a federal indicator. And all that means is that we as a team have to report data around this piece to the federal DOE, okay? So your child find data gets reported to the federal data, to the, to the federal DOE. So it's really, B11 is, it's really around that, the timelines. So when you're thinking about that, make sure that your avals for big school, not CDS, are completed within that 45 school day timeline, right? From the date the consent to avow is received, okay? You wanna make sure that you rec re blah, blah, sorry, record on the consent form when, they, when it was received back in the SAU. And we look at your school calendar so that we can count school days to make sure that we're clearly documenting that school day timeline. We look at the evaluations, we look at the written notice, and then like I mentioned, we report that to the Office of Special Ed Programs. We, re we report that to OSAP, okay? Abbreviated day. So as I mentioned, our information, the information that we gather really changes based on what the federal government asks us to look at, based on what the field sort of shows us. Abbreviated day is one that we were tasked with a year ago, maybe two years ago, um, because abbreviated day is one that has been sort of problematic across the state. Um, so we were really asked to, to pay very close attention to abbreviated day. So we generated this one pager so that we could take a very close look at abbreviated day for educational or medical reasons, because those are the only two times you can put a student on abbreviated day. So these are the pieces that we would look at. If you tell us a student is on abbreviated day due to educational reasons. So similar to the IEP quick reference document, you can see along the left-hand column is the finding or the code. And then the middle column, you can see what we're looking at and the MUSER reference. So for example, ADWN is the code, and that would be, we're looking at the basis of abbreviated day. Was it educational or was it medical? And where are we looking for it? We're looking for it in the written notice. We're looking in the written notice for some clear documentation of what, what your determination was, okay? And then we look to see, is your LRE percentage based on a full day? Because it needs to be. How did you come to that? How will the student access curriculum and IEP services? We look in the IEP, section six and seven, and we look in the written notice. And you can see how the rest of that gets determined. What are we looking for and where are we looking for that in terms of abbreviated day for educational reasons? And this would be abbreviated day for medical reasons. So these are these are some more resources that we were we will have available to you in case you have students on abbreviated day. All of this information is in MUSER, but again, as I mentioned, MUSER is just such a dense, dense uh, document that this information is hard to access. We pulled it out for you. Out of unit placement. This is something else that we look at as part of the monitoring process. It's embedded in MUSER, but it's hard to find. So we set this up very similar to how we set up the um, abbreviated day document so that you can see the finding, the code, what are we looking for when we come on site and we look at your out of unit students, where are we looking? So you know exactly what we're looking for. We will never surprise you, okay?
Other considerations. We have what we call fun facts, which again, cracks me up, similar to IEP quick reference document, which cracks me up because it's 14 pages long. Um, and we have, again, worked to develop some of these one page fun facts because Muser is so overwhelming. So this is one that focuses on the initial evaluation process. And it really just walks you through the steps from when the referral is submitted to the initial IEP implementation. What are the steps? What are the timelines? What, what do I need to do? And what are the timeframes in which I need to get these things done? Um, you can see that the timeframes are bolded. You can see that it's very clearly delineated what's a school day, what's a calendar day, because that in itself can be really overwhelming. I wish that when I had first started teaching, somebody had handed me this document because its I, I just think it's really well done. Um, and this is a more visual representation of that same, that same process. Um, so if you're more visual, which I am, this is just another way to represent this. And this looks at CDS and it looks at the SAUs because as you know, CDS has a, uh, has a different time frame. So these are just two, again, one page documents so that you don't have to flip through Muser and try to make sense of that, hoping that this is a resource that will be a little bit more helpful for you. And this is another one that just takes a look at some other important, really important timelines that we are all tasked to pay very close attention to, right? So the advanced written notice, again, the timelines are bolded, the user references are there. Uh, so for example, the advanced written notice needs to be sent to parents at least seven days prior to the scheduled IEP meeting. These are regulatory. These are things that need to happen, okay? Waiver of seven day notice for an IEP meeting. Annual IEP review must be held within 364 days. When we come on site and we do an audit with your SAU or your CDS site, these are the types of things that we look at, okay? These are the things that we are tasked to look at. We do not have wiggle room. We cannot say to you, oh, you held your IEP review 366 days. Okay, that's all right. We, we can't. We'd like to. You know, we'd like to give you you know, but we're not allowed to do that. And this is why, right? I mean, it's 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 regulatory. But these are just some more timelines to just help you have this right at your fingertips. And we hope it's we hope it's useful. Just a couple more. And these are not currently up on the website, but we are working frantically to get them up there. Um, and these are just some of the others that we have. We have abbreviated day, disciplinary removals. We've got more on the federal indicators, communities without schools, home instruction, least restrictive environment, parentally placed. What is the 1%? That's around alt assessment and the written notice. And I would be very, very interested in any sort of feedback that any of you have if there are others that you're struggling with, or if there are others that you're like, you know what, I just can't ever remember this thing, or I, you know, I always have to go to Muser for that thing, or could you just help me? Could you, you know, if, if there are others that you think would be useful for us to put together, we would gladly do that for you. Because if you're struggling with one, there are other people who are struggling, okay? I, I when I was teaching, I would have loved something like this. So if if there if you have other questions about anything like this that you think would be useful for the field, please let us know because we would love to do that. We, we'd be happy to do that. Um, seriously, let us know, okay? We would like your feedback. Um, we say this all the time, but we do take your feedback very, very seriously. I am in and out of this feedback form all the time. And we have made significant changes and frequent changes to our professional development, to our um, how our professional development looks, to how we present it. We've added slides, we've taken slides out, we've added breaks, we've added things, and we've made lots of changes based on the feedback that we've received because these are not our trainings. These are your trainings. So if there are things that you need us to change, if there are things that you want us to add, if there are things you want us to do to make them better, we want to know that. You're not going to hurt our feelings. So um, 
you can use the QR code right here with your phone. It will take you to that link. It will take you directly to it. I don't know how many questions there are. I don't remember, but there aren't many. It won't take you very long. Or you can go directly to that link. So please do that. And then Carly, can you be more specific about exactly where the link takes them in terms of, does it take them right to this training? Uh, it takes them to the form that they'll fill out with a few questions and then uh, you'll be asked to select the training that you attended and it should be right at the top of the list somewhere. It'll have today's date. So 9, 13, 23, and it will say resources or something like that. You select that training, you'll be prompted. You'll be asked if you want to contact our certificate. And if you say yes, then you'll be prompted to enter your email and just make sure that you spell your email correctly so that the email can get to you. Um, and you'll get a contact our certificate and I will send a copy of the PowerPoint. I apologize. I didn't have the link ready. Usually I drop that at the beginning and I totally forgot. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to our last little bit or anything they want to share or I usually say questions or cries of outrage, but I'm kind of tired. I don't know that I want any cries of outrage today. Anything I did in the make chat? a PowerPoint link for those of you that are interested in it. It is in the chat right now. So okay. if you want to grab that, and I will still send it with the email with the contact hour. Fantastic. So just the last little bit, Carly made this um, slide and we all about lost our minds. This is, usually we just do an office hour slide. Um, and then Julie, our wrangler, said, why don't why why do we do that separate from all? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know. So this is all of our PD. This is everything. This is our IEP training. This is our B13 training. This is everything. So this is all of our PD from today all the way through the end of the year. Um, so please take a look at this. You can go on and register. Um and, you know, the more the merrier. We we love it when, you know, we love big old groups and we we, we want to hear what you have to say. We are doing uh, in October a discipline and manifestation determination training and a special ed law for general ed teachers training. And we would love it if you could, you know, just share those links out widely uh, for PD opportunities with your general ed buds. Um, you know, put a little post-it up in the teacher's room. Uh, you know, the discipline and manifestation determination piece, that's not just a special ed issue. That's, that's you know, school-wide. So we really want to get that information out because, as you know, a lot of times that lands in, in the special ed department, but that's not where it starts, right? I mean, so we want to make sure that we can get that information out. Um, also, writing measurable functional goals in February, avoiding outcomes and consultation and related service goals in May. So we're getting more and more related service providers at our office hours, which is fantastic. We love it. But please share, you know, all of these, of course, with your related service providers. But um, I think those in particular would be would would be really useful. So, um, oh, Colette, yeah. excuse me, Colette, just a quick note about the um, the full schedule. Um, mm -hmm. I that went out to all the directors earlier this week. Um, it also went out to the list that Carly was able to pull from um, attendees from last year's um, office hours that we could that we were able to get out of the system. And so we sent them to them as well. But if anybody wants their own copy or they you know want to see it, they can always email me, too, and I can quickly email it out to them. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we want to get this out to as many people as we can. So, you know, the more the merrier. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. So, you know, when I used to teach and I taught for a long time, I sort of thought about Department of Ed as this sort of bureaucratic, I don't even know what, that just their their only job was to sort of make my life miserable, you know, changing forms and, you know, who do they think they were? They're just making my life rough. And I have to say that um, I, I didn't see DOE as, as part of my team and and I don't know why that is, you know, that was just, it was just in my head. And I, I, I wish that that had been different. And I, I just, I, you know, my team here, we work really hard and we want you to know that we are part of your team and we want to support you. 
and we want to be available to you. And, and we work really hard at that. So we are, you know, we're out in the field, you know, we were, we were out in the field this afternoon with an amazing team. They're just kicking it. It's so great. And we see great stuff every single day. And we're so proud of you. It's so hard to be teaching right now. And I know that, but I just, we're so proud of you. And I don't say that lightly. I really don't. I'm not just blowing smoke. We're really proud of you. And we do consider ourselves to be part of your team. And here's our contact information again. So please feel free to reach out to us. Please feel free to reach out to us and share the great stuff you're doing. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to you know, vent, if you want to say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. I need help. If you have um, an IEP, if you have a goal and you're like, I just don't know how to write this goal. I need help. Let us know. Reach out to us and say, I, I don't, I can't quite figure out how to word this goal. Is this goal measurable? Is this present level okay? Is this service grid okay? What I would say to you is, you know, get in front of it, right? Get in front of it and send it to us. Don't send it to us on an IEP. Send it to us in an email. Send it to us as a hypothetical. Don't put any child information on it. Just if this were an IEP goal, how does it look? Because we want you to be successful. We want you to do well. So if you send us a hypothetical goal in an IEP in a in a in an email, we're going to give you feedback. We're going to tell you how to fix it. We're going to help you write it. Okay. So please feel free to do that. Please feel please feel free to access us. Access us that way. I am so sorry. I'm tripping over my own tongue because because we are your team and we are here to help you and we want you to know that. So if there's anything we can do, you let us know. My team, Jennifer, Julie, Carly, Ashley, is there anything else? I am Des planning to put the um, fun facts on the website tomorrow. So fantastic. Okay. Is there anything from any of our participants? Does anybody have any questions or no? It's three forty. I have a question. Okay. It, it's kind of a um, the the link that's put up. Is there any way to get it emailed to us without having to sign into an Adobe account on our computer? I just don't have one for my work computer. I just have my personal account. Absolutely. Yes, if you filled out the con if you filled out the feedback form and asked for a contact hour certificate, then it will get emailed along with the contact hour certificate. Oh, see, that's what I get for trying to open it and not listening to that part. Thank you. No problem. No problem. All right, you guys. Look at this. You got 15 minutes of your day back. Oof. Don't spend it working. There you go. Hi, Jen. I didn't even see you come in. <laughs> All right, you guys. Go have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. And I hope I see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.